incredibly pleased and honored to have him here. Emmanuel Mogenet heads the um, Google Research Europe uh, in, in Zurich. He uh, is originally French and uh, worked all over the world, uh, Europe, Asia, US. In 96, he co-founded a company, Nothing Real. Well, Nothing Real was the name of the company. Uh, that was then acquired by Apple, where he spent a couple of years. And then in 2006, he left Apple and joined Google Zurich. And there, eventually, he headed uh, the uh, search efforts in Zurich, and then in 2015, he started to organize a group that has now become Google Research uh, Europe, um, which focuses primarily in machine learning, natural language uh, understanding, and so on. And um, if I'm not mistaken, that is now the second largest uh, research group of Google outside of Europe. Um, outside of the US. Uh, sorry, <laughs> outside of the U.S., Mountain U, I guess, being the other. Yeah. And as Emmanuel puts so nice on his blog, the, the people in Zurich uh, are enjoying a different kind of mountain views. That's right. <laughs> All right, so with much further ado, please welcome Emmanuel Mogenet. Thanks, Marcel. All right, thank you very much for having me today. I'm, I'm very happy to be here, actually. I'm, I'm uh, you know, I grew up uh, actually across the lake, so it's, it's, you know, it's a really nice thing for me to, to present my work here at EPFL. All right, um, so very brief introduction. Um, you know, I had the Google Research Europe Lab, and we focus on three areas, uh, computer perception, natural language, and machine learning. And what I'm going to try to present to you guys today is uh, what we're trying to achieve there and how these three pieces actually um, come together or will hopefully come together to, uh, to help solve a, a fairly hard problem. So a uh, very brief reminder, uh, this is Google's mission statement. Uh, it's, it's really remarkable that you know, we've been at it for um, over 15 years now. And you know the, the the statement itself has become increasingly relevant over time, right? And with the advent of, of really big data and machine learning, the statement is 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 now you know incredibly strategic, not just for the company but but for humanity as a whole. So I'm going to start by giving you a, a very brief historical perspective of what Google does for a living. Uh, one way to think of Google, which few people actually realize. Natural language understanding, and what I mean by natural language, I mean semantic understanding of human language, not just you know speech to text, but actually understanding the meaning of natural language. This has been Google's core business from day one, right? If you think of it, you come to Google's website, and then you enter a question, and we're trying our darn best to actually answer that question. Um, doing it without understanding it is actually pretty hard. Um, but, Pretty much for the first, I would say, nine, 10 years, that's actually what we were doing. We found a really, really nice hack called information retrieval that's capable of mapping a particular question to a particular answer without understanding either of those, right? So when, when you came to Google in the last 10 years and you asked a question, we sort of pointed you in the right direction, but the true meaning of the question totally escaped us, right? We, we were just you know, really, really good at, at uh, if you've ever used a, a cooking book, uh, at using the index of the cooking book. Like if you want to find where chocolate cakes are in a book, you look up the pages for chocolate, you look up the pages for cake, you intersect them, that gives you the pages for chocolate cakes. That's all we did at Google, except the book was the internet, pages were web pages, and the index was, as you can imagine, fairly large. And then the secret source of ranking, you know, showing things by, by relevance. But at, at the core of what we did, we didn't really understand what the user was asking us. We actually got so good at this, we're down to the point, and I invite you to try later on, um, you know, ask your phone, why is the sky blue? We, we're down to finding the paragraph on the internet that has the authoritative answer to that question without understanding it, right? We've, we've built that incredible map from question to answers without getting anywhere close to the meaning of the question. In 2010, something changed. Uh, we, we started to assemble this, this gigantic database called the Knowledge Graph. And this is essentially a, a very, very large database that contains factual information about the world. 
And when I say factual, I simply mean, you know, you, this is the perfect tool to win a trivial pursuit. You can, you, you, you're going to know what the land mass of Switzerland is, what the population of Japan is, how old Barack Obama is, these, these sort of like, you know, well-known and well-established things about the world, right? And for the first time, we allowed our users to actually query that very large database using natural language. So this, this was really the first time in Google existence where we actually understood our users' question and gave them pointed answers to these questions. Uh, anyone can grab their phone and ask, you know, who is the president of Switzerland? Uh, how old is Barack Obama? You know, that type of things. The problem with this is the way we attacked understanding questions was mostly pattern-based. Right, so we, we have a, a very long list of patterns at Google, and when you say something like, uh, what is property Y of entity X, where property could be population and an entity could be a city, for example, we recognize the pattern, we're capable of converting it to a database query, essentially. That, that's one way to think about understanding question. Are we capable of converting this question to a database query? So when you go to Google and you say, you know, what's the weather in San Francisco? Ah, okay, pattern is known, weather, place, transfer, convert to a database query, return answer. Um, so this is great, this is actually a fairly useful tool, but um, there's that kind of questions. Um, will it be dark by the time I get home? No entities in there. The answer to this question is most certainly not anywhere to be found on the internet, as you can imagine. Uh, so there's no way to map the question to you know, an answer. The only way to get there is to actually understand the question. It's, and we don't today. You, know, you can try that query, it's not gonna work. Or if it does, you know, I'd be presently surprised. Uh, but uh, here's the, 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 a, a really frustrating insight. Um, this thing, we have all the data to answer it. We know where you, where you are, usually. We can typically predict, I know. <laughs> that is if you allow us to know, right? Um, we, we, we understand traffic patterns, which means we're, we're, we have a fairly easy way to predict the time by the time, what time it'll be when you get home. We can calculate the time the sun sets on any point on the planet. So all, all the pieces of the puzzle, right, we have them. We, we could cobble them up together to give you the answer. We just don't get the question, right? Okay, so um, that is what we're trying to solve in Zurich. We're trying to attack natural language, and I'm gonna try to give you, and, and this is you know, by no means solved or, or anywhere near being solvable, but we're going to give it our best in the, in the coming five years, and I'm, I'm gonna try to outline our, our plan of attack. Um, so, Couple of things to think about. Why is natural language so hard, right? You know, when, when you write computer code, we can write a compiler that, that sort of quote unquote understands that computer code, right? But natural language, you know, human language is, is basically really hard to grasp for computers. So um, the first insight, and one, one that's uh, it's actually obvious in hindsight, but uh, it's, it's something that you know, it took probably 20 years for, for people in the field of AI to realize. The reason natural language is really, really hard, it's because it makes constant implicit references to the world we live in. And all of you guys in this room, you have this marvelous little simulator in between your ears that understands the world we live in. You all know that if I, if I drop an open bottle of water you know, unpleasantness will ensue. You, just by me seeing, saying it, you're probably sort of visualizing something in your brain, right? We, we all share this model of the world, and, and it's not just a model, it's a model combined with a simulator, right? With that thing, we're capable of communicating, because when I say things to you, you permanently refer to this model in your brain, right? And, and that allows actually very efficient communication, because the, the, the language basically, because there's this implicit prior, right, doesn't need to tell a whole bunch of things. The problem is computers are completely blind to this, right? Computers have no clue that, say, um, if you see a car, there's likely a road nearby. And usually it's the car that's on top of the road, not the other way around. All things that are utterly obvious to us all, 
which our computers are completely blind to. For, for a computer, the likelihood of a road you know, being underneath a car, a car being on top of a road, is about the same as a giraffe standing on, a, on top of a 747. These things are equivalent, right? So one of the reasons natural language is so hard is because computers lack that big reference, that big encyclopedia combined with a simulator. Um, the second thing I want to mention on this, it's there's, a, there's been an attack on natural language which is based on parsing, on grammar. It's, you know, we've been pretty busy doing this in the AI field for, for the past, what, 50 years now. Another obvious thing in hindsight, children don't start by learning grammar and then learning language. That's totally the wrong way around, right? Children learn language, and then later on we teach them grammar, which, yes, once in a while allows them to sort out really complicated cases in, in, uh, when, they, when they read text, right? But even, even an educated person, when they read a book, they're not applying grammar rules, they're not parsing the text, right? So the, the, this, this insight, insight is that you know, the, the whole parsing attack on language is, is probably a dead end. Right? And then we're really starting to realize that now. So here's, here's an example of why language, human language, is, is irritating, uh, to say the least. So you take a sentence like, I need to catch a train. Right? Um, if you look up the definition of catching things in the dictionary, unless you have a really, really, really big dictionary, you're not going to be able to make sense of that sentence. Right? Catching is about animals. Catching are about falling objects. Catching is are, are about, you know, things thrown at you, maybe. Um, but catching is not about trains. So why is this sentence obvious to us all? Right? Because the meaning of catching evokes in our mind things like running, things like uh, a desire to, you know, to, to, to grab something, or to, and then you also know that trains are moving objects. So it all coalesces in your mind and starts to make sense, because these concepts Right? evoked by the word to catch, sort of, funnily enough, apply to a moving train. Right? Again, unless you have a very, very big dictionary of the world, unless you have you know, an encyclopedia that explains that, yes, indeed, the word catch can be applied to trains and then sort of explains why, then you're left in the, in, in the, in the cold to actually understand that sentence. So what do we do? Uh, do we learn the world by rote? Do we build a giant encyclopedia of all the things that are possible in the world and all the analogies that are possible in the world? Like, you know, this pattern of concepts applies to this situation. And actually, that's one of the things that, that creates human laughter. When, when we see a nice pattern applied to an unusual situation, we tend to find this funny, right? Um, there's no way to learn this by rote. There's, there's no way to, to essentially, you know, build a database big enough to contain all these possible analogies. So um, there's a couple of things, you know, that are the conclusions to what I'm saying here. The first is that we need to start to build a model of the world where we can actually reason, where we can actually find patterns, and that we can actually apply this pattern to language if we ever hope to, um, um, to understand language. And this is sort of the goal that we have in the, in the Zurich Lab, it's to solve common sense. The second insight about common sense is, again, I'm, I'm going back to children. Um, how do children learn about the world? You know, you all, you all know not to uh, step in front of a moving car, right? How did you learn? This is not encoded in your DNA. Although, you know, the, there's, there's a whole bunch of things that are actually encoded in your DNA. Wait, evolution is actually a, a mechanism by which we've learned about the world, uh, the, the long-form version. But the moment a kid opens his eyes, he starts to observe the world, he starts to learn about the world, he starts to build what machine learning people build prior, called priors. Right? We, we start to build this, this complicated world model or simulation engine that's, that's about what's possible in the world, what's likely in the world, and what's unlikely in the world. Right? And then eventually we get to the point where a normal human adult knows not to walk in front of, 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 of moving cars because of, you know, it can simulate and model the implications. A whole bunch of things that are obvious to us right, are completely inaccessible to computers. Okay, so if children learn about the world by looking at it, essentially, why can't we do the same with computers? 
That's sort of the, the, the insight we've, we've had in Zurich. Um, another thing that uh, uh, I, I want to point out, you know, children don't just learn by looking at the world. They also learn by interacting with the world. You know, you, you learn not to put your fingers in a, in a wall socket, uh, sometimes the hard way. That's the, you know, there's, there's a feedback loop. To do the same with computers implies building robots, which is um, kind of tricky. Um, and we're probably going to get there at some point. But we, we're going to start by simply uh, using, you know, what we can see. And here's another interesting uh, thing to consider. Um, the, 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 bit of math, the bit of math is, is really, really simple. From the moment a human opens their eyes to the moment they die, it's, you know, they're going to be exposed to about 20 billion pictures. That's, that's, you know, if you do the math, assuming you parse images at 10 frames per second, and assuming you're awake 24 hours and you leave 80 years, that's what the, the number, the order of magnitude boils down to, right? So you as a human are going to see about 20 billion pictures in your life. There's probably 10 times that on the internet today, not counting videos, right? So um, why don't we use this vast amount of data that's out there? And I'm talking about public images here. I'm not talking about you know, people's photos. I'm talking simply grabbing stuff that's on websites for, for anyone to consume. Um, use what's on YouTube video and try to start to learn about the world using that giant data set. So um, this is what we like to do. We would like to use all that data to learn a world model. And what I mean by this is, is really building this complicated prior about things that are likely in the world and things that are not likely in the world. We're, we're going to start very simple by simply counting things that co-occur in the world. Right? We're going to count the number of times we see a cow in the picture and then the number of times that co-occurs with grass. And we're likely going to discover that these two things have a tendency to happen together. And like, you know, if we count 747s and giraffes, we're not very likely to find that many uh, um, in, in an actual picture. So, um, number of things that we need to build to get there. Um, yeah, of course, it's going to be machine learning helping us hopefully to get there. We need a very powerful computer vision stack. So we need something that's capable of taking an image, segmenting it into the entities in the image, and also gain some sort of understanding of the relationship between the entities present in the picture. We need lots of data, but we do have that, right? Again, all the images on the internet, all the videos on YouTube, let's start with that and see where that gets us. That's harder. Um, for those who are not familiar with, with the term labeled data, uh, it's the good old idea that, you know, if you try to teach a computer how to recognize cats in picture, you need to have a lot of images of cats, but labeled, aka, if the question is the picture, the answer, is there a cat in that picture, yes or no, is given to the computer. So we show them, you know, a million of computers, of, of images of, of cats with the answer yes, and then a million of images that have no cat with the answer no. That's called labeled data. Unfortunately, uh, that's pretty hard to come by. Most of the data in the world is unlabeled. It's basically, there's lots of questions, but you know, the answer hasn't, hasn't been provided, right? Um, machine learning today, in particular deep learning, is extremely good at learning complicated things as long as the data is labeled, as long as we present the question and the answer uh, at the same time. Unfortunately, like I said, um, that's very hard to come by. We need humans to actually label data. And uh, most of the data, typically all the images on the internet, are unlabeled. The real question is, do we really need labeled data? So this is one of the things that we're really pushing on uh, in, in the lab in Zurich. It's um, making the state of the art around unsupervised machine learning progress. So the, the key idea here is, you know, make sense of data, the data that's outside in the world, out there in the world without labels, right? And one, uh, one key observation is that data in the world is hierarchical. Or rather, we humans have found a way to grapple with the data in the world using quote unquote divide and conquer. We, we do understand the world in hierarchical ways. 
there's not like one giant tree to explain the world. There's typically you know overlapping hierarchies, but this is this is the way we handle the world, right? If if I think of whatever the planet, then we're breaking down into continents, we're breaking down in countries, we're breaking down in countries, in in cities. There's there's tons of stuff in the world that's sort of like you know can be organized hierarchically to make sense of it, right? To extract patterns essentially. And, and the key idea is we need to get unsupervised machine learning to actually learn these patterns, these hierarchical patterns, by itself. So this, this is one very big area of research. And uh, there's, there's a sort of light at the end of the tunnel currently, a uh, combination of what deep nets can do, uh, the, you know, the, the new hotness called the generative adversarial neural network uh, that were invented in the last two, three years that are starting to yield amazing results in that space. Uh, another thing we would like to build in Zurich is a, so this common sense database, uh, at the end of the day, uh, not everything can be solved by machine learning. In particular, uh, we need to, if, if we want this, this uh, common sense database to be useful, it needs to be able to simulate. We need to be able to create inference, right? We need to, to be able to deduct things from things that we observe. And there, actually, the quote-unquote classical approach of knowledge modeling, where you learn that a cat is an animal and uh, an animal is something that breezes uh, most of the time, uh, you know, the, organizing the, the world by, by hierarchies and properties, we can actually uh, sort of use humans to model high-level concepts in a traditional fashion and uh, use this as a scaffolding, as a skeleton that machine learning is, is going to build on or, or that machine learning is going to flesh. So the, the idea is to accelerate our understanding in the world. We, we start by encoding high-level concept in a, in a fairly traditional database, basically, or, or knowledge database. Um, so we, we have an effort in Zurich that's trying to do this and trying to sort of cobble up the, the old approach and the, and the new one into a, a final byproduct. Um, I'm a little bit running out of time, so um, I, I'm, I'm going to skip on some of this, but there's a weird connection between, when I say weird, interesting, there's a connection between <clears throat> natural language, computer vision, common sense, in the sense that they are organized in a feedback loop. Um, so what, what we would like to build is basically not just this, this linear thing, but it's, imagine this actually organized in a circle. So we take images, we feed them to a fairly smart computer vision system that's capable of understanding what goes on in there. We use unsupervised hierarchical machine learning to actually organize this properly. We use the common sense database, the, the, this, this scaffolding, this logical scaffolding of things we know to be possible in the world encoded by hand. We use this to understand natural language. And where the weird feedback loop happens is that natural language can actually help computer vision. We have an experiment running uh, in Zurich where we take an image, we, using deep learning, we generate a caption, and that's like you know, uh, one of those black box maps where an image comes into the sausage machine on one end and a sentence comes out the other. We take that sentence, we feed it through a natural language understanding system that tries to give semantic meaning to the sentence, and then we take this interpretation of the image and bring it back to the computer vision system to help it understand the image better, right? So it's, it's, not, a, it's not a pipeline, it's, it's a loop, right? And uh, the, the hope is that we're going to have a system that's sort of going to iterate on what it observes in the world until it converges slowly on a sort of a coherent model of the world. Okay, and um, this is basically where we'd like to get. Uh, so if you look at this image, um, I'm, I'm suspecting your reaction is going to be, oh, you know, the image is somewhat funny. The question is, you know, how do you get to this conclusion? Why is this image funny, right? Try to think of all the things your brain is doing in order to reach the conclusion that this image is funny. The first thing you do is you're obviously recognizing the guy in the center, right? He's fairly famous. And then you, not, you understand that he's probably surrounded by his collaborators, people that are fairly serious. Uh, and then you're understanding that pushing on the scale is actually you know, sort of like uh, making the person on the scale believe that he's heavier than he is. Uh, 
because these people are typically serious, this sort of makes the scene much more interesting and much more funny than, uh, than, than it normally would be. To get a computer to understand the subtleties you know, of this simple picture and, and get them to understand why human would find it funny, for example, right? We're basically, I don't know, 10, 15 years away from being able to do this. But that's, that's sort of the hope, that we're going to get uh, one step closer to the be, being able to do this. So if we manage to build that kind of, uh, that kind of pipeline, that kind of you know, in-depth understanding of, of language via looking at the world, uh, there's short, tons of short-term application. Uh, one of the things, by the way, that, uh, that's happening in Zurich, so the Zurich office, uh, uh, the Google Zurich office is actually more than just a research lab. It's actually first and foremost an engineering lab where there's about 2,000 people working. The, the research group is about 150 people, which is sort of like the, um, the newest kid on the block, I would say. Uh, there's been engineering teams working in Zurich for, for a long time. One of them actually works on building the assistant. So this next generation Google product where you're going to be able to use your phone to sort of talk to and using natural language and it's hopefully going to help you in your day-to-day -day lives. Um, if we manage to truly understand our users when they talk to us, understand the semantic meaning of their question, understand the circumstances of their lives, uh, and, you know, should they allow us to, we'll go read their email, we'll look at uh, what they do with their phone, we'll try to understand, in the same way a human assistant tr tries to understand the person they, they support, right, in order to help them better. We need to understand what our users are doing, we need to understand the circumstances of their life, we need to understand their intent, uh, we can help them with their communication if we can actually understand those communication, right. The, um, the, the good example, I mean, one of the first applications is actually in context conversations. When you talk to Google, instead of having to repeat every bit of information, you know, for every new question you ask, we start to understand the discourse in the conversation you're having with, with Google, and we're capable of, of not forcing you to repeat. There, there's there's one, uh, very, one piece of demo that actually works today. If you say something like... Uh, uh, how old is Barack Obama? And then the next question is, um, how about his children? Uh, we actually start to understand that uh, you're actually referring to the previous question and that you're asking a question about an entity that was, I mean, there's a little bit of inference, there's a little bit of natural language parsing. But we want to get to the point where you can really have a, a human level conversation with Google, basically. Uh, and yeah, the last bit, depersonalized user modeling. If the, the better we understand our users, the better we will be able to help them in their, in their personal lives. Long-term application. Uh, if we manage to crack this, this is a fairly large step towards uh, general AI, right? I mean, the, the holy grail of, uh, of AI is, of course, to um, pass the Turing test. Uh, if you are not capable of having human-level conversation, that's basically not going to happen. Uh, if we do this, I mean, it's, it's actually kind of hard to imagine the impact this would have, right? Uh, this would solve education. We can, we can probably use robots to teach kill children, however, you know, scary that might sound. Um, we can, uh, you know, finally be able to communicate with the machine uh, in, a, in a way that's, that's going to be much more intimate, right? Uh, I, again, pretty hard to imagine the long-term impact of, of us being able to crack that particular nut. Okay, uh, that's it for me, and uh, I guess we can open it up to questions yep. if there's any. Well, first of all, thank you. <laughs> all right, ask away. Any questions? Okay. Start over here. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your talk. It was really interesting. Uh, and I was wondering that um, I was wrestling another talk from Google uh, regarding uh, mobile phones. And they were really highlighting the word context. And now you talk about uh, taking all these images that the internet offers us and that we don't have labels. What I think is that actually, well, the images are not there just pop up. It's, it's not an isolated image. 
an isolated entity. So all these images are in websites that they talk about something or they have captions. So we can always take all this information uh, as a labels, uh, I think. This is one of the questions that I want to, uh, to ask you. And the other is, you say that the uh, human can see 20 billion images in, one, in their lifetime. And in the internet contains 10 times this. But the level of images that we get are with really different nature. And these images are not internet. Internet is biased to what the people want to show. Mm -hmm. So we don't have every, everything there. We don't have people sleeping, for example. We don't see pillows. And it's something that we see. Sure. So And YouTube, I would disagree. There's probably well, yeah, quite a YouTube, there's many things. <laughs> but what I, what I mean is, did you consider the possible bias of internet? Mm -hmm. OK. so. To your first question, I agree. Uh, there is actually some sort of labeling of information on the internet. That's actually the way image search works uh, uh, on Google. We actually, you know, the, up until recently, we didn't really look at the images. We only looked at the text surrounding them in order to, uh, to do the job. Um, but the data is very noisy, if you think about it, right? It's not like you have a, an image and a very high quality description of what goes on in there. And usually, it comes in the form of a sentence, which I remind you, we don't understand yet. Um, so it's not like you have a picture and then a list of, you know, this image contains a cat, a beach, a bicycle, and a hat, right? It's like, you know, oh, a picture of so-and-so um, at the beach this summer. So the data is noisy. It's, it's not exactly what I would call labeled data. Um, with regards to the bias, I agree. Uh, there's a uh, there's very likely a bias in the in the data. Uh, I'll say this: you know, building this is all about bias in the first place, right? You know, the, the, there's stuff that's possible in the world and stuff that's not possible in the world, and that's what we're trying to learn in the first place. But I'll agree: there's lots of situation that we're not going to be exposed to uh, when when this happens. But you got to start somewhere. Right? It's, it's the, the basic premise is let's see what we can learn by looking at what's out there on the internet. Right? Uh, and then you know, if, uh, if there needs to be more, we'll have a very nice substrate upon which to build uh, and, and maybe go acquire the missing bits somewhere. OK, more questions. Are there any over there? Otherwise, there's here. Thank you very much for your, for the great talk. Um, so I was actually going to follow up on that on the earlier question. You are not considering people as streams of incoming data, as I suppose, in terms of the way that you are dealing with the problems you discussed. Because uh, it seems like okay, in a short context of a question like who is the current president, who are the ch his children, of course you assume okay, this, these questions follow on you know, up on each other, but the whole stream that comes from one individual person does not appear to be used as a, con as a generic context for whatever the interactions they have with Google. Um, is it the case or are you considering that as a, as a part of the whole um, mechanism that you're building these context-based um, conversations with people or not? And um, my second question is if you do, do you have um, an, a plan or do you have an idea of how you can pack this uh, into just a small device like a mobile phone instead of a, a back and forth communication between people and Google so that the people won't f kind of feel disturbed when you say, oh, we look at your emails and we sure. look at the stuff that uh, you just said. So Thank you very much. To, to, your, to your first question, as of today, uh, when you interact with Google, the, 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 what we call the contextual search engine does not take into account personalized data. It's mostly you know, the conversation you've had with Google in the last 10, 15 minutes. It's also where you are, and it's also what you've been doing on your phone. So we sort of use that data to basically try to understand the question better. Uh, there's, there's a nice little demo where if you stand next to a river, you can say, how long is this river? And we'll take your location into account to sort of rewrite the question. Right? But that, that's the state of things today. Uh, the hope and the plan is to actually take in, 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 into account who you actually are, uh, what we know about you, as much as you've allowed us to, to know. Right? It's, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm giving this, this explanation uh, uh, very often. Right? Uh, my human assistant knows a lot of things about me that I've willingly told, uh, told her, and this is 
extremely helpful to me, right? This, this makes uh, her work and our communication much, much more efficient. Um, and yes, you know, from a privacy perspective, she, she, she knows everything about my life. Um, if the assistant is to ever help the users in depth, we're gonna need to know about our users, right? The, the key idea is that the user should, be, um, should have absolute control over how much Google knows about them. It's, it's the, uh, the, the, you know, if, if you don't want to tell Google anything, there's a limit to how much we'll be able to help you. Uh, if you're willing to tell us things about you, and that means if you allow us to look at your email or to know where you are or to look at your calendar, we'll be able to be 10 times more helpful. But at any moment, you should be able to flush everything we know about you, press a button and erase every single bit of information we have about you. That, that's one of the key philosophies. So A, you, you choose to share what you'd like to, and the moment you're, you're uncomfortable, you should be able to flush it. The second thing is the, um, um, the what can we do on the device? Uh, that's, that's a very interesting question. There's, there's a couple of answers to this. The first is we would love to use machine learning to do on-device inf inference. Right? And, and basically never, never have to call home, never have to call the server in order to understand something complicated. So we would like to be able to take everything that's happening in your life, where you are, all, all the torrent of sensor data that modern devices are pro producing, right? Uh, accelerometer, hygrometer, pressure sensor, uh, GPS data, you, you name it, call logs, whatever. All that stuff that's in your device, we should be able to use as feature in a machine learning model that can understand the circumstances of your life. Uh, there's there's this one thing, small thing that we've been building in Zurich. It's uh, something that tries to decide if it's the right time to disturb you. You know, the modern devices are super annoying. The the practice with that uh, try to evaluate or what the impact of the assistant will be on the performance of human brains. Because if you stop memorizing, I mean, all these things people are told when they age that they need to exercise their brain, it sounds like there's going to be less of that. So I'm not saying it's not good. I just wonder if somebody's worrying about it and anticipates it. Um, okay, so the, the, that's, that's a question that's as old as technology to, to a certain extent. Uh, you know, the, the same question could be rephrased for cars or, you know, now that people are cars, will they... Uh, Stop walking and stop exercising. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. So, but our calculators, right? You know, most people are incapable these days of, uh, of performing a multiplication in, in, with, with two digits in their head. I am. Um, I am I'm not capable, is what I meant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the question of, you know, will the assistant make people completely incapable of, of, uh, of operating on their own? Um, I don't know that Google is actually thinking about this. Where our focus is always on, you know, how do we help our, help our users, or how do we make technologies available to our users to actually simplify their lives? Uh, and uh, much in the way that a car manufacturer is not necessarily thinking about obesity, I, I don't think Google is actually thinking about this. Uh, that's that's a you know an interesting point of view. But then, let me ask you a question in return: What would you do? not build the assistant uh, for fear that it would actually make people, uh, you know, incapable of operating on their own. No, no, I think you should do it. There is no doubt about that. But I think it would still be interesting to try to imagine what the impact could be to anticipate what should be done. Okay, so maybe, maybe a somewhat uh, funny answer would be, you know, if the assistant gets smart enough, uh, it might be start smart enough to, to see when to stop assisting you because it's bad for you. Uh, <laughs> So that's why you see you should anticipate. <laughs> no, no, fair enough. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> okay, we have one more there in the middle, and then we have to finish. So uh, both uh, Nuria and uh, Emmanuel will be on stage at uh, 11:30 for the panel, where we can uh, talk about some of these questions. We we had it there. Yeah. Is it on? Yeah. Uh, I understand that the, that unsupervised machine learning is the best way to understand the natural language and that labels are flexible, uh, are not flexible, but it's not worth to keep labels with a very high accuracy. Um, for example, you don't need to remember each word of my question, you just need to know where it's found to, no? I'm sorry, I didn't get the last part of your question. Uh, no, I'm saying that in 
that I understand and uh, unsupervised machine learning is the best way to understand the natural language and that labels are not flexible. But it's, uh, it's not worth to keep labels with very high accura accuracy prediction. Uh, for example, you don't need to remember each word of a question, you just need to know where it's point to, no? Um, so, Basically, let me let me maybe you know explain better what, what I mean by supervised and unsupervised, right? If you um, if you are given a task to say um, name objects, let's take computer vision for for an example, right? If you're presented with a data set that has picture of objects and the name of the object in the picture, you're basically in a supervised learning setting, right? If you have a bunch of pictures with nothing explaining what's in them, you are in an unsupervised setting. And what you can do in that second setting is try to cluster pictures that look like one another together. So for example, you can take all images of cats and then say, ah, these images look like another, one another. So if, if you've essentially sort of like, you know, uh, grouped all the images with cats in them, you've sort of started to understand what a cat actually is without being able to put a name to it. Okay, so this, 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 is, this is supervised. And then there's semi-supervised when only some of the data that you have is labeled, typically a tiny set, and then you need to sort of spread the, the label. That's, that's what humans do much better than machine, by the way. We, we only need to three, three or four pictures of a cat before we, we know how to recognize cats. In, in the case of natural language, um, the, the, the whole, you know, going from a sentence to a semantic understanding, uh, so far, we've been much better at doing it in a supervised setting. And uh, the, the unsupervised attempt uh, in the space of language understanding are, are really not working very well today. Uh, so it's not about necessarily understanding all the, world, the words in the question, it's, it's really about getting to the meaning. And yes, agreed, you don't need to have sort of like an explanation for every word in a sentence. It's more at the, and when we do supervised learning, it's more like, you know, here's a sentence, here's its quote unquote meaning. Uh, and then modern machine learning system typically will go from one to the other without necessarily paying it the same level of attention to, to every word. I'm sort of hoping I'm answering your question. All right, otherwise there's time in the break to discuss. Thanks again very much. All right, thank you.